and open your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. We're going to be in uh, Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20 this morning. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one right in front of you in the chair. It's on page 1090 of the Pew Bible there. So we've been going through a series this December looking at the cast of Christmas, those um, those characters, those people that are central to, to Chris, the Christmas story and, and what we can learn from them. We started a couple weeks ago with uh, the prophets, the preparation and expectation. Um, we looked at the many prophecies that uh, pointed to the birth of Christ. Uh, many were told seven, eight hundred years before they came to pass, but they were spot on. I mean, pinpoint precision in the details. And the likelihood of any one person fulfilling just eight would be one in 100 quadrillion. And Jesus ultimately fulfilled over 300 in his life. The prophets were used by God to prepare people and to fill them with expectation for the coming Messiah. So that we may have certainty concerning the things we have been taught, as Luke put it in the introduction to his um, his letter, his gospel. Um, that's one of the important truths that we learn from, from Luke uh, 1 through 4, is that our faith must be, filled, f- must be built on facts and, and not on feelings. It's, it's not a fable that Jesus was born in a stable. We can trust the Bible, what the Bible says, because it's historical, it's verifiable, it's orderly, and it's certain. God used the prophets and their prophecies to help provide that for us. Lastly, last week we, we looked at, at uh, how God worked in Mary before he worked through her. Mary's faith and focus. Mary was just a, an ordinary girl from a small town that didn't have such a great reputation. And Mary, Mary was, was going to marry a blue-collared carpenter named Joseph, preparing for a simple life in a simple town. When the mighty angel Gabriel shows up and announces the impossible, Mary, this, this simple virgin girl that lived in the country, this little country town on the, on the wrong side of the tracks, will become pregnant with the Son of God. For whatever reason, God had chosen her to bring salvation into the world. It's an important lesson that it doesn't matter who you are or where you come from, God can use you for an amazing thing. And he'll use a process that will work through your fears and your, your mind is fascinated as he reveals his truth to you. Your faith increases and fortifies your will to embrace his plan for your life and, instead of your own. One of the important truths about our Christian faith is that God always works in his people before he can work through his people. God uses a specific process to, to deliver spiritual progress in our lives. Nothing is impossible for him to do in and through you. Mary's Christmas is proof of that. This week, we're going to turn our attention to some other cast members from that Christmas morning that, that God used in an extraordinary way. The shepherds used to spread the hope and joy of that first Christmas. Most of us don't hardly give them a second thought. Or if we do, it's not really truly who they, they were. You know, that serene image that we have on a lot of Christmas cards of these sweet shepherds you know, singing songs by the, the campfires is actually a bit exaggerated. We've romanticized the image of shepherds of that time. In Jesus' day, shepherds were a rough bunch. They were social outcasts. They were, they were shiftless. They were dishonest. They, were, they would be more likely to be cussing than to be singing songs, singing carols. Now, early in Israel's history, shepherding was a noble profession. Abel was the first, and then followed by Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and David. God himself called himself a shepherd. We're compared to sheep, but that's but that has more to do with us as being dumb sheep than him. It's not meant as a compliment. But by the time the first century came around, shepherding had lost its luster. There were few jobs more demanding or degrading than a shepherd. 
They were among the lowest class of people, just ahead of lepers. The Talmud, a collection of interpretations from rabbis, says, no help is to be given to heathens or shepherds. Shepherds were not thought very much of. They were not very well thought of. Instead, they were considered ceremonially unclean. Their flocks needed to move around to find fresh, fresh grass and fresh water, so they, so they never stayed in any one place for too long. Because of that, they weren't able to regularly attend um, religious services. So they couldn't, they couldn't participate in many of the ceremonial uh, cleansing cer- ceremonies. So they were considered unclean by the Jews. They were treated with contempt and mistrust because they were always on the move with no real roots. They, they were often thought as, as roaming thieves, kind of how we sometimes looked at, at gypsies and hobos, always on the move from town to town. Because they were so untrusted, their, their testimony wasn't, wasn't even allowed in court. They were known to be brash and bold. I mean, they lived out in the fields with their flocks, and they lived with other shepherds. They were a rough bunch. You had to be to live like that. They had foul mouths, and they were accustomed to fighting. That's how you solved problems out in the field. Shepherds were not well-liked. They were not well thought of. And yet, God entrusted the greatest message ever to a bunch of salty shepherds. And isn't that, that isn't very unusual, is it? God has always worked wonders for the little, for the least, the lost. If you read through Luke's entire uh, narrative, you see that Jesus came for the marginalized, the poor, the forgotten, the outcast. One of the reasons why the Pharisees hated him so much, that he, he, he eats with the sinners. God has always used the least expected. An old man like Abraham, a stutterer like Moses, a little boy like David to take down a giant, a virgin like Mary, or an old worn out carpenter like me. God can use the most unexpected people. He often does. That way his power is shown. As we look at the shepherds today, I want you to see that God must work in you before he can work through you. God, Luke, Luke chapter 2 gives us God's version of a, of a birth announcement. So listen to verses 8 through 12. Read with, read with me. Um, allow yourself to be filled with awe, with expectation, and wonder as we read these verses. Luke chapter 2, 8 through 12. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Now I see five Five steps that the shepherds took that first, uh, that first Christmas. There are important lessons for us, important things for us to, to follow them in. The first thing that we see about these, these shepherds is they, they were attentive. They were attentive to their job. Luke 2, verse 8. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. Not only did they work the third shift, but they worked first and second shift as well. This was a, a 24-7 job for them. The hills and the fields around Bethlehem were, were prime grazing land, and many of the sheep used in the, in the temple for sacrifices came from this very area. And on the road to Bethlehem was a tower uh, called Migdal Eder. It's called the, the Tower of the Flock. It was an important lookout that was used to, to watch over the flocks of sheep that were there. John 10, 11 says that Jesus is the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. 
A shepherd is also a sheep. John the Baptist declared in John 1.29, Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. If you want a little more prophecy, check out Micah 4. Micah 4, 8 through 10. And you, O tower of the flock, hill of the daughter of Zion, to you shall it come. The former dominion shall come. Kingship for the daughter of Jerusalem. There you shall be rescued. There the Lord will redeem you from the hand of your enemies. Now isn't it interesting that the Lamb of God was born in the area set aside to raise the sheep to be sacrificed? The same place the prophet Micah said that Israel would be rescued, redeemed from the hand of their enemy. This, this is where the shepherds were keeping watch 24-7. It wasn't a glamorous job. People didn't necessarily care very much for them. But they took it seriously. And they were attentive. They were watchful. Constantly scanning the, the, the horizon for signs of trouble, for predators, for, for those who had wandered away from the flock. Keeping watch even in the dark of the night. A lot more that we could talk about. But here, here's the lesson for us today. In spite of what others thought of them, God chose to announce the amazing news to this very unlikely people that were busy at work. God came to those who were attentive to the jobs that they were given to do. They weren't sleepy slackers that were not willing to work. They were paying attention to what was going on around them. They were watching. They were watchful. They were attentive. Do you want God to reveal himself to you? Be attentive. Pay attention. Be looking. Be watching for him. Maybe he has. Maybe you're you're just not paying attention. Maybe you're ignoring him. Do you want to be used by God? Be busy. Be busy working where you are. Now, don't be wait. Don't wait to be, be called to some far flung mission field abroad or some new calling. If you're not busy where you are now, why would he call you to someplace new? If you're not being faithful, if you're not working where he has placed you now, where why would he why would he send you someplace else? God came to these unlikely shepherds and he was able to use them because they were attentive. They were watching. They were working. No matter what kind of job you have, you are not insignificant to Emmanuel. He will meet you right where you are as you work faithfully to what he's called you to do. And he will use you in a way that you could never imagine. Sure, these shepherds never would have imagined that they would receive this glorious news. While they were attentive to their responsibilities, the shepherds suddenly were suddenly awed by an angelic announcement in Luke chapter 2, verse 9. And verse 9, and an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great joy. God meets us where we are, but then he brings us to our knees. God's Shekinah glory lights up the sky and they shake in their sandals as they're standing in that field. For the first time in centuries, the glory of God has returned to the earth. The cry of, of, in Isaiah 64, 1 is being, being answered. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. That's what Isaiah cried. God would return and reveal himself. Maybe the shepherds were, were so afraid, were terrified, because they didn't know if this was an angel of judgment or not. Maybe, maybe the angel had been sent as, as payback for all those raunchy jokes that they had been telling around the campfire. Maybe their, their d- dirty language. Maybe their sticky fingers when they went to town. Maybe they were worried their sins were finally catching up with them, and they were about to be vaporized. 
Whatever the case, they were in awe. And it would take a lot to scare these tough guys. I wonder if they were thinking of Judges 13.22. We shall surely die, for we have seen God. Moses, when he asked to see God's face, he had to hide in the cleft of a rock. And he was only allowed to see the shadow of the Lord passing by him. Otherwise, he would die. God told him to take off your shoes, Moses, for this is holy ground. When you come before me, this is holy ground when you are in my presence. Whenever we come face to face with God's holiness, how can we not just fall apart because of our sinfulness in front of him? Like Peter in Luke 5, 8, when he said to Jesus, get away from me, Lord, for, for I'm a sinful man. Some of us were talking earlier this week. We, we kind of all agreed. One of the biggest things missing among Christians nowadays is reverence for God. Respect. Recognition for who He is. Talk of Him as, as our Papa God. The big man. All of these things. The man upstairs. Forget who He is creator of the universe, who spoke everything into existence, who holds everything together by the word of his mouth. That's who God is. When you experience God in your life, are you in awe of him? He shows up and, and answers a prayer, provides what you need. Are you in, in awe the God of the universe loves even you? That he sent his son into the world to redeem even you? The shepherds experienced God's presence in their lives and they were awed. And after these attentive shepherds were filled with awe, they accepted the message of good news, of great joy. In verse 10, And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Behold, which means listen, look, pay attention. Get ready to tell you something. The angel says, calm down because he's bringing good news of, of great joy. The, the Greek word is mega, which means exceedingly large, loud, and, and mighty. It says, listen up, guys. I have, I have big news, news that is for all the people, everyone, our friends, our neighbors. The whole world needs to hear this. What's that big news? Verse 11, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And notice the three words used to describe this baby born in Bethlehem. Savior, he came to save us from our sins. The name Jesus means the one who saves. Christ, he is the anointed one or the Messiah in Hebrew. He is Lord. This title in the Hebrew word is Adonai. Referring to the master, the owner, speaks of his total possession and, and my total submission. The shepherds are told what to look for in verse 12, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. God gave them a sign because of the extraordinary nature of the message. The angel told them the signs because he expected them to go and look for Jesus. They knew about a long-awaited and promised Messiah. They probably knew about many of the, the prophecies about him. This is how you will recognize him. A baby wrapped in swaddling cloths. This sign comes from the, the shepherding culture. The primary job of these shepherds was to, to raise perfect male lambs without spot or blemish to, to be used for the temple sacrifices. One of the ways that they would keep them this way was to catch the firstborn lamb and then wrap them in these swaddling cloths and then put them in this stone manger so that it couldn't thrash around. It couldn't run around and, and get dirty, blemished. And these strips of cloth were, were from the old priestly garments. They were used as wicks to, to light the menorah in the temple and they were reused to, to wrap these these baby sheep, these sacrificial lambs at birth. 
One commentator writes, When the shepherds looked at Jesus wrapped in old priestly garments, they saw their Savior, the great high priest, who is both the Lamb of God and the light of the world. He was lying in a manger. While it may not have been uncommon to see babies swaddled in, in cloths, there would only be one lying in a manger, a feeding trough. And it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be like this wooden one here like we use. More than likely, it would have been a, a big hunk of stone that was carved out. That's what they normally would use. The Lord often reveals us himself to us in ways we recognize and understand. And sometimes ways that we may not, at least not at first. Suddenly a, a whole regiment of, of rejoicing warrior angels fills the sky, praising God in a, a thunderous chorus in verse 14. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among them who he is pleased. God's Peace is a, is a gracious gift to those who are objects of his pleasure. How do we please him? By accepting his grace and his forgiveness through Jesus. Glory to God in heaven for setting this all in motion. We've all heard the amazing choir sing the Gloria. Other hymns like it. But they would have paled in comparison to this, the, the heavenly hosts. Singing praise to God. We know the shepherds accepted the message because in verse 4, 15 we read, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. Have you accepted the message that God has given you? Have you accepted the gift of Jesus, the grace and the forgiveness of your sins? Have you allowed the, the, the Word of God to work in you? God's good news is a gift that must be accepted, must be received for it to be activated in your life. Have you done that? Have you done that? Because it's more than just a simple prayer. Just because you said a prayer when you were eight years old in, in Sunday school isn't enough. Sorry to tell you that. If you've been told that, You've been told a lie. It's one thing to say you accept it. It's another to act on it. Knowing must lead to going. The shepherds didn't just accept and enjoy the message they received. They acted on it. They went to see so that they could witness this firsthand. Look at Luke 6, uh, verse 16. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. The idea behind haste is, come on, hurry up, let's go. This is the, the first Christmas rush. It's an amazing detail for a couple reasons. First, normally shepherds moved slow. They were very deliberate in how they moved. So that they wouldn't startle the sheep. And so they were very gentle and slow when they moved. So that the sheep would follow them instead of getting spooked. And they left their sheep. They were financially responsible for each sheep that was in their care. And yet, they hurried up and they left these sheep to go see this baby Jesus that the angel had just told them about. They weren't worried about money. The Messiah was here. They were going to go see him. The Bible is clear, acceptance must lead to action, as James 2.17 says, 2, says. So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. They could have doubted, they could have delayed, but it stayed. instead they accepted the message and then they moved. When you are confronted with God's message, what will you do? Will you move? Let's see what these first responders did. They went and they saw. The first thing they did was run to Bethlehem and, so they could see this baby with their own eyes. The word found means to find after a thorough search. They searched for Jesus. They were active in trying to find him. They kept looking until they did. Do you even try to find Jesus? 
Or are you too worried about what you'll have to leave behind? And then they left and they shared. Look at verse 17. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. Other translations say they spread the word. They, they proclaimed abroad. They, they told everyone what happened. We are here to get today because they did not stay quiet. Because they couldn't keep quiet about what they had seen. They didn't just hang around the manger looking at the newborn Savior. Because as the world's first missionaries, they knew that they were now managers of that new message that had to go out into the world. It was for all people. They went and told everyone what happened. A Savior is born. God's promise of redemption has arrived. Verse 18 describes how the people responded. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. To wonder means to be amazed, to be astonished. It's used 12 times in the Gospel of Luke to, to, show, to show people's response to Jesus. Are you astonishedly amazed when you consider what Christ has done? If you are not yet saved, you need to come see Jesus for yourself. If you are saved, it's time for you to go and share the Savior with others. It's not enough for you to say you have faith or to feel good about the Christmas story. There comes a time after seeing that we must be involved in sharing. Often people who try to tell all they know are, are politely avoided, right? I mean, people don't like to listen to someone who never stops to take a breath. But people listen to these shepherds because these shepherds weren't supposed to know very much. I mean, they're just shepherds. The message that they brought was revolutionary and breathtaking. They spoke from their heart because they were touched personally by God. Their words connected with the deepest need of others. So go tell the story of God in your life. You don't have to embellish it, but you don't need to hold back either. God can even use you to spread the news and change the world. Saw so one more step in the process God took the shepherds through. They adored him. You see this in, in verse 20. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. Now, the shepherds may have went back to their same jobs, but they were not the same on the inside. They returned to where God had put them, and, and they continued working faithfully. And they worshipped him fervently. They were taking the place of those angels as they now glorify and praise God. This was now an important part of their work, where they worked. God has placed each of us where we are so that we can be the ones to worship God there. To share the hope and the joy that we have there. Unfortunately, many of us, many of us worship our work and we, we work at our play and we play at our worship. But when God appears to you and you hear his message, your, your heart opens up, you're awed by, by who he is and what he has done. The realization that God has sent his son, the Savior was born to redeem you. To accept that amazing gift of mercy and grace. You cannot help but to, to respond and act on that glorious news. If you come face to face with your Savior, you will never be the same. You can never be the same. And the hope and the joy that will fill you, well, well, you won't be able to do anything else but worship Him with the adoration that He deserves. Do you want God to reveal Himself in your life? Be attentive. Pay attention. Is He trying to talk to you? Do you want to be used by God in a profound way? Be busy working where he has you right now. Be attentive to what God has called you to do. 
Be awed by God's message to you. It's profound. It's life-changing. Accept the gift of good news, a Savior born to redeem you. Act on what you know to be true. Go and tell everyone you know, just as the children closed out their program with. Go, tell it on the mountain. And then worship and adore the newborn king. Hope and joy has come. Amen? Let's make sure we get the facts straight about the Christmas narrative. Christmas is real history. It is real history. But it must become your story. Listen to Luke 2, verse 11, one more time. Today, right now, a specific time in history, in the city of David, fulfilling a 700-year-old prophecy from Micah 5.2, a Savior, the one who saves from sin, has been born, the incarnation where the infinite became an infant. To you, emphatic, personally, for you, He is Christ, the long-awaited anointed one, the Messiah prophesied in the Old Testament. He is the Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah, the great I Am, sovereign, master, leader. Jesus was born to the whole world, but He was also born to you and for you. And He would die in your place as your substitution. I close with three questions. Is He Savior to you? Is He Christ to you? Is He Lord to you? Corey Tenboom once said, if Jesus were born 1,000 times in Bethlehem and not in me, then I would still be lost. It's time to make sure that Jesus is born in you this Christmas. Don't leave here until you accept that great gift. Consider the words of the song that we're going to close with here in a second. How many kings, how many kings have stepped down from their thrones? How many have abandoned their homes? How many greats have become the least for me? How many gods have poured out their hearts to romance a world that is torn all apart. How many fathers gave up their sons for me? Only one did that for me. All for me. All for you. Hope and joy have come. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, Heavenly Father, we we come before you and we thank you that hope and joy has come. Father, we thank you that you loved us enough to, to reach out, to reveal yourself in a profound and amazing way personally to each of us. You sent your Son into this world to be born to walk among a fallen creation, to live a a sinless life, and to die a martyr's death, all to redeem us. And all that we must do is accept, receive that gift. I pray that you would help us to remember the hope and the joy that we celebrate this Christmas season. Pray that you would help us to be attentive, to be awed, to accept this this great message and to, to act on it as we go tell it on the mountain. We would we would adore the Savior that has saved us. Pray that you would receive the honor and the glory that you deserve. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together as we close with a song.
subject of a child in a manger. Lowly and small, the weakest of all, unlikeliest hero wrapped in a small bare shoulders to child. Is this who we waited for? Is how many kings stood down from their thrones? How many lords have abandoned their homes? for me and all for you. Do you want God to reveal himself to you this season? Pay attention. Be attentive. Be watchful. Do you want to be used by God? Get busy where you are. May you celebrate the hope and the joy that has come into the world. Amen? Amen.